Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today's discussion about allied cooperation on infrastructure. I'm John Hillman, director of the Reconnecting Asia Project at CSIS. And first off, I'd like to thank our guests and the governments that they represent for supporting and participating in this event, um, and also for doing, doing so across some uh, pretty different time zones. Um, I'd like to invite all of you watching and listening to this discussion to submit questions through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And then I'll do my best uh, toward the end of the program here to get as many of those questions into the discussion. Uh, and you know, I think this is a very timely time to have this discussion. Frankly, um, I think you know, allied cooperation is so central to many of the global challenges that we face today, especially issues related to economics and technology. But that cooperation is not always easy, um, and I think this is a really um, a good opportunity because the three governments represented here today, the United States, Japan, and Australia have come together in a deep and sustained way to help expand the availability of high standard infrastructure projects, particularly for developing countries. And to me, their efforts represent a hugely positive and strategic shift. Um, it's easy to criticize what others are doing and you know, having studied other infrastructure efforts myself, including China's Belt and Road for several years, there's plenty to criticize. But criticizing isn't competing. And to compete, you need to offer compelling alternatives. And what's so encouraging about this trilateral partnership is that it's not just a partnership on paper. It's actually having some real world impacts. We can see it driving multilateral efforts to raise standards and mobilize private capital. We can see it attracting interest from other countries. And it's actually starting to lead to some real projects too. There's still a lot of work to do in order to realize the full potential of this partnership, but there's already a lot to learn here. Uh, lessons for more recent efforts like Build Back Better Worlds, which the G7 announced in June, and even broader lessons for for forming coalitions on economics issues um, and operationalizing allied cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. So let me briefly introduce our guests and we can get the conversation started. Isabel Kane is head of trust and head of the trust and business initiative at OECD, where she oversees the coordination of the Blue Dot Network and related projects that strengthen public-private cooperation to inform policies and improve their implementation. Craig Chittick is first assistant secretary of the U.S. and Indo-Pacific Strategy Division at Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. He's responsible for the implementation of Australia's Indo-Pacific strategy, as well as bilateral and multilateral relationships with the United States, Canada, ASEAN, the East Asia Summit, the Trilateral Strategic Dialogue, and the Quad. Um, and Craig gets the award today for joining us from the most difficult time zone. I believe it's just after 11 p.m. in his evening. So thank you, Craig, for doing this. David Marchik is the Chief Operating Officer of the US International Development Finance Corporation, where he manages agency policies, oversees business operations, and coordinates strategy and priorities. Fumio Yamazaki is director of the Development Assistance Policy Coordination Division at Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He's responsible for coordinating Japan's grant, loan, and technical assistance policies toward developing countries. So really a, a terrific group here to help us talk, uh, not only about the, the trilateral partnership, but also some of the broader efforts that this partnership has helped inspire and has been really driving. Um, and so to, to get us some context here, I'd like to just sort of step back for a second. And David, I'd like to turn to you and ask um, if you could just say a few words about how this trilateral partnership came about. Um, what was the, you know, what was the origin of it? Um, and, and we see some of the some of the um, uh, work that it's been doing, but how did this all begin? So thanks very much for having me and it's great to see my colleagues and it's great to be uh, 
Philly with CSIS. CSIS was the first place I worked after graduate school. And so always uh, feel very fond about that. So let me mention a little on the trilateral um, infrastructure partnership, and then also kind of feed that into the Build Back Better for the World Initiative, because I think there's a lot of alignment there. So the, the, this trilateral infrastructure partnership came about because there was a growing recognition um, of the need to highlight the approach to delivering sustainable development as an alternative to the kind of predatory um, approach that other alternatives uh, provide. So one um, alternative provides state-run, not very transparent, often coercive debt financing. And another provides transparent, private sector-driven, um, non-opaque, project-based sustainable financing. And so we and our partners on this call felt that we had a like-minded approach to leverage our strengths, develop pipelines, share market information, identify and mitigate risks, and execute on, on, on projects. And so that's what we're doing. So this, this partnership was signed in November of 2018, and it was an effort to tackle the many problems in the Indo-Pacific together to help ensure it would remain free and open, stable, uh, prosperous, and also to promote inclusive growth. Let me just say that a lot of the concepts that were embodied in this partnership were later embodied in what's called the Build Back Better for the World Initiative. And that came out of a conversation that President uh, Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson had with President uh, Biden in March, where they were talking about the Belt and Road Initiative and like many leaders had frustrations with it. But Johnson and Biden said, let's do something about it. And so through really good staff work by a fellow named Dilip Singh, who's the Deputy National Security Advisor at the White House, they worked with the G7 to come up with a similar framework, which is where the G7 will also come together to drive values-driven, transparent, non-coercive, private sector-driven infrastructure uh, initiatives in the developing world. And that's what we're doing now with our G7 partners. So we're very excited about both of these initiatives. We think they're highly, highly strategic. We think that they create a good alternative and we think that uh, we can do some good work together and drive development outcomes in the region. Thanks, and I, I, I'm hoping we return to the um, to talk a little bit more about uh, Build Back Better World and maybe some of the lessons that um, you know this this trilateral partnership might offer for that effort. Obviously, that that effort is um, even larger in its um, in its membership and you know potential resources, which is a real. Uh, an upside, but also, you know, with more countries comes more coordination challenges. Um, let me turn to Fumio for for a minute and and just ask um, if you could reflect on the foreign policy implications of this trilateral partnership. You know, I think it, it's it's something as the Build Back Better World partnership is doing that is really designed to meet a global economic need. But there are some broader implications here. And so I'm, I was wondering if you could help us understand some of those. Sure, thank you. Um, indeed, the uh, Japan, Australia, and United States share the fundamental value and the same strategic vision. Um, these three countries have the ability and will to promote quality infrastructure in the region. And the cooperation among these three countries would contribute to um, provide quality infrastructure and to stable and uh, bring to the region stable development and prosperity. And this is further important in realizing free and open Indo-Pacific. Um, when I talk about quality infrastructure, um, the quality infrastructure means uh, resilience against natural disasters or inclusiveness, which realizes the idea of leaving no one behind and sustainability in line with the social and 
environmental conditions, considerations. And at the G20 summit in 2019, the leaders agreed on G20 principles for quality infrastructure investment. So I think this uh, trilateral cooperation, as well as the like-minded cooperation, is a good vehicle to realize the uh, quality infrastructure, which then brings to the prosperity of the region. And that is the value orient to create value-oriented value uh, region as well. Thank you. Thanks, and I, I do think that that's uh, that's one of the big opportunities here. I mean, the the agreement around um, the quality infrastructure investment principles, I think, was a, a pretty landmark agreement, and to have the G twenty, um, you know, a range of countries agreeing to that set of principles, very encouraging. And then the challenge becomes, how do we operationalize those principles? You know, how how do you implement them, and how do you ensure that um, you know people are actually carrying out those principles, realizing them in practice. Um, Isabel, if I could turn to you, um, I know this is, this is related to a lot of the work that um, you've been coordinating for the Blue Dot Network. Um, you had a big event earlier this week, which I would encourage others uh, to watch, a really great conversation um, and, and some new announcements as well. Um, could you just give us a little bit of a sense of, uh, you know, for those who weren't able to watch that event yet, where does the Blue Dot Network stand today? Um, and uh, obviously this, this group of three countries was pretty important in, in getting it started. Yeah, no, absolutely, Jonathan. And, and thank you for inviting me here today and really pleased to join our founding members um, of the Blue Dot Network, which is the arm that has looked to operationalize the quality infrastructure investment principles. So just tacking on to what Fumio has, has already highlighted, this was an initiative launched by the US, Australia um, and Japan to operationalize QII in a way that we could really start to, to implement and see the practical outcomes and the projects that would be aligned with, with QII. Um, the Blue Dot Network has had um, clear momentum over the, 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 the last um, few months and, and over the last year. We see it gaining momentum um, through the acknowledgement um, around the globe really um, two days ago, as you said, the US Secretary of State engaged with OECD ministers on the potential for the Blue Dot Network. Uh, it was present on the Quad statement, the leadership statement uh, uh, recently in the, in, the, in the forthcoming weeks. It was central to the Talent Digital Summit um, uh, a month or two ago, and it was endorsed by the Three Cs Initiative uh, last year. Uh, but maybe it would help if I could uh, take a step back to contextualise some of the OECD support for the Blue Dot Network and to really understand what has happened in terms of mobilising and developing a global certification framework that not only seeks to operationalise QII, but also is in the heart of the Build Back Better world, um, according to the, to the White House fact sheet. Um, so what we are really here to do is to advise and develop and support uh, the, founding the, the founding members uh, to develop a global certification framework. Um, to summarise really what the Blue Dot Network seeks to do is it seeks to send a signal to market that a project meets the environmental, social and financial um, principles or standards that we would anticipate uh, and, and that are commonly recognised in an international community. So to date, we have really developed an, an evidence base that outlines the value of a global certification framework to promote private sector investment and to close the infrastructure gap in developing and emerging economies. Um, we've built an executive consultation group of world leaders to advise us on the development of the Blue Dot Network. Um, this multi-stakeholder group really comp comprises of, of 160 leaders from over 96 OECD and non-OECD member countries um, across the infrastructure value chain, including investors, bankers, engineers, academics, union leaders, civil society leaders, and professional services firms. Um, they came together, uh, as you've highlighted, John, uh, this week at the OECD to talk about the potential for the Blue Dot Network and to outline um, what are some of the, the benefits of it um, and also um, where, where some of the risks might lie in terms of, 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 of finalising um, the, the, the global certification framework. So with that, what we are now really focused on is um, designing and, and finalising our recommendation for 
um, the trilateral to, to really launch um, the global certification framework. I think the final words of, of um, the US Secretary of State was let's get going uh, at, the end of the, um, at the end of the meeting. And, and what we intend to do moving forward is, is to really ensure that we can create a recommendation that aligns international standards in a way that is credible and legitimate for market. So to summarise, really, the momentum is gaining, the interest is gaining, and we're having both substantive and um, uh, stakeholder engagement from around the world. That's great. I, I, it is good to see the momentum and that sense of urgency, um, you know, the, the spirit of let's get to work. Um, I, I, you know, I think sometimes, especially people in the, um, you know, sort of foreign policy, national security space might not appreciate sometimes how long it takes to actually prepare for infrastructure projects, especially those that are going to meet these higher standards. Um, and so the, the system that um, you're working on, you know, I think the, the kind of mission behind Blue Dot is when that is in place, it's going to make it easier for, um, you know, investors to put money toward projects that they know meet those standards. Um, and so I think that's a really, uh, you know, potentially game-changing development. Um, and it's tough, right? Because it hasn't been done before. I mean, if it was easy, it would have already been done. And this is yeah. this is new and territory. And also you're certifying exactly across the life cycle of a project, across all forms of infrastructure in different regulatory jurisdictions. So it's a very complex um, system that you need to develop. And, and we're very thankful that the US, Australia and Japan have provided um, lots of feedback and input and the likes of yourself, John, you're, you're, you're on the executive consultation group for CSIS provide us technical and, and high level guidance on, on how to operationalize it in a way that's both efficient and credible for markets. Well, I, I, I do want to return a little bit later in our discussion to some of the announcements early, earlier this week, but I'd like to turn to Craig um, for you know, some reflections on lessons learned. Um, you know, as, as David mentioned, we're, we're kind of approaching the three year anniversary for this trilateral infrastructure partnership. Um, you know, I think it's clearly it's been informing and driving some of the work um, behind Blue Dot Network, um, Build Back Better World. Uh, Craig, could you just reflect a bit on some of the lessons learned um, from bringing this group of countries together um, and, and having this sustained engagement? Thanks very much, Jonathan, and thanks to CSIS for, for bringing this uh, group of people together to talk about uh, you know, trilateral cooperation and work that we're doing with the OECD. It's, it's a really timely, uh, timely thing. It is, it is late at night here, but I'm really pleased to, to, be, to be talking to you. Look, I think that, you know, it, this is a very complex issue and, and I often try and simplify it for my own understanding to, to much simpler terms. I think the things that we have learned most is about knowing your customer and caring about your customer. There's also knowing your partner as well, and I can get onto that later, but this goes to the commonality of all three uh, of the partners to the Trilateral Infrastructure Partnership. Um, we all are deeply engaged in infrastructure development uh, by ourselves and have been for decades in the Indo-Pacific. Um, we all care about the countries that we're working with. Uh, these infrastructure projects have a great potential in their own right for local communities. But as both David and Fumio have emphasised, infrastructure is much more than that, of course. Uh, it's an enabler of the sort of Indo-Pacific region that each of our countries have visions for. Uh, we've got our own sovereign Indo-Pacific strategies. They're almost all exactly the same name. And the principles that underpin that are incredibly similar. Um, so knowing your customer, knowing what they want. Uh, I recently spent three years as Australia's ambassador to Vietnam um, and spent a lot of time listening to the Vietnamese government about what they needed on infrastructure. Um, knowing good quality infrastructure, not just the, the, the amount of it, the quantity of it, but the quality of it is absolutely essential and really goes to the heart of Isabel's project at the OECD to really fill out the Blue Dot network. Um, you also need to know your partner as well. Uh, and uh, the three countries working together with a variety of agencies um, and working together on individual projects, I think is something um, that we've learned a lot. Uh, and we've learned that 
each project, not even each country, each project requires a very specific set of tools, sometimes different sets of tools. Um, and having a blend of financing uh, available, particularly uh, in middle income economies uh, that have access to capital markets uh, is incredibly important. And certainly my experience in Vietnam uh, was that there was no shortage of good ideas for infrastructure projects, but the number of bankable projects that could be bought uh, before funders, uh, whether those are uh, uh, funders like uh, the trilateral partnership or multilateral development banks, uh, that was a, a much, much bigger task. And so being able to blend uh, debt finance together with grant uh, instruments is something I think we've found uh, to be important. Um, uh, and that and that allows us to take a much more proactive disposition and not just to sit back and look at project pipelines. Um, we spend a lot of time looking at project pipelines, uh, but to actually go uh, and identify projects <clears throat> that may not be quite ready yet uh, and to work with uh, the governments of those countries to help them through that blend of, of different uh, instruments um, to be able to develop good ideas into bankable projects uh, that the, 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 the various uh, uh, assets that we bring as three different countries uh, that we're able to do that. Uh, so that, that's, I think, the, 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 the things that we've learned, I think, most out of this is uh, we have long experience at running our own infrastructure programs uh, in the Indo-Pacific, uh, and the potential for the three countries to work together is very profound. Uh, it's, it's finding uh, what is the right mix of tools from each of uh, the partners uh, to apply that against... Um, uh, the projects that make uh, that make the most sense, and and we're learning that, and we're changing we're changing our approach. We're being very flexible. We're being very nimble, and uh, and that's allowing us to to approach future uh, opportunities uh, uh, with with a different mindset and a different tool set than even a year ago. Fumio, did you want to comment on this as well? Yes, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I would like to echo Craig, particularly on the point that. They, uh, we need to uh, hear the voices of the customer. And that I would like to em uh, emphasize the point that um, the taking into account the needs and intention of the recipient country is the key to uh, further promote trilateral cooperation. And in order to uh, make the cooperation more, uh, more effective, the, uh, the way to collaborate in a, a flexible manner is uh, very important, not only uh, insisting on trying to uh, create one single joint project. In that sense, uh, there is one good example that we have already uh, in not only limited to the trilateral cooperation, but uh, the, uh, with the uh, like-minded countries. That is the... Uh, Papua New Guinea's electrification partnership, which is announced in 2018 by Japan, Australia, United States, and New Zealand. This is the project that pursue the, uh, it's, not, it's not the partnership that has one single uh, joint project that is uh, done by four countries, but each country provides support to enhancing the, uh, uh, connectivity to electricity and thus contributing to developing uh, PNG's quality infrastructure as a whole. This partnership establishes with the request of the PNG and respond to the need of PNG wishing to connect 70% of its population to electricity by 2030. And this is, I think this is a good exa example of flexible collaboration based on the needs of the recipient country. Back to you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for mentioning that that project example. Um, I, you know, I think we there's a lot to learn by looking at those individual experiences. Uh, I think something that that sort of is coming out of your comments um, as well as Craig's this this idea of uh, flexibility and just recognizing the fact that um, different partners are bringing different tools to the table, and those tools sometimes have different capabilities and different constraints too. And so, you know, what you might be able to do on one project um, could be very different from another. 
you know, I think on the U.S. side, one of the encouraging developments in recent years um, is the creation of the, the U.S. Development Finance Corporation. Um, and, you know, David, I'd, I'd be interested in, you know, you're, this is a relatively new institution. I mean, it's, it's, it includes parts of previous institutions, but it's a new institution um, with some new capabilities. And, you know, could you tell us a little bit about, for example, you know, equity authority is a new capability. How are we seeing that working? Um, and is there, you know, is there anything we should be doing to try to, you know, really unleash the full potential of the DFC? Great. Well, thanks very much for that uh, softball question. I could go on for a long time about uh, the great agencies. So, yes, uh, the DFC is a new institution. It changed from the previous uh, agency called OPIC. And there were several significant changes. One is the size doubled from 30 to 60 billion, giving us more firepower. Two is that we had enhanced tools. So we now have authority to invest equity. Three is it eliminated the nexus requirement between a US uh, investor. So that gives us much more flexibility to focus on the core mandate of the DFC, which is to drive development outcomes. Uh, President Biden has really pushed the agency to stretch in response to COVID, <clears throat> in response to the climate crisis, and because we're one of the, the key agencies implementing the Build Back Better for the World program. So just to give you an example, uh, the DFC has invested on average about $4.2 billion, DFC or OPIC over the last five years. And we're gonna come in well over 50% above that. Uh, we've been asked to press very hard on health investments and we're gonna, increase our health activity by some five to six times. Uh, we're really proud, I'll give you an example of one of the, of the flagship projects we've done in cooperation with the Quad, Australia, India, and Japan, which is a project, you know, normally the DFC's projects lifts people's lives. This project, which we did with the Quad will save people's lives. And that is, we went around the world very early with uh, Australia, Japan, and India, to find options to increase vaccine manufacturing. So what we've learned, we've learned a lot in the pandemic, but one of the things we learned was that our supply chain and our capacity to produce vaccines was way too small. Prior to the start of the pandemic, we had about 5 billion doses of vaccine capacity for everything. That includes uh, yellow fever, influenza, et cetera, polio. We know that we need something in the era order of 11 billion doses per year for uh, COVID. So working with the Quad, we went to a number of companies uh, around the region and we decided to partner with a company called Biological E in India. Uh, we provided them with financing and cooperation with the Quad and that company will be on track to produce over a billion doses of COVID vaccines by the end of 2022. They're ramping up they're starting to produce. They have a new facility uh, that we financed. And it's an, it's an exciting example of how when partners come together on a shared mission, you can have significant results. And this plant, this facility, this company that we're backing will save tens of thousands of people's lives by getting shots in arms. And the, the the quad dimension of this, I, I, I think, is another important development um, and, and maybe one just sort of worth briefly unpacking for people who, who may, may you know not be tracking this quite as closely. A um, little, little less than two weeks ago, um, the first in-person quad leader summit uh, included an announcement of a, a coordination group for infrastructure. And so I think that's a, you know, another positive development, an outgrowth of um, I think, you know, what began as this trilateral partnership. Um, and I think what's encouraging about that is, I think, as, as several of you have underscored, the need to understand the customer. You know, if, if, we, if we care about actually making attractive alternatives available, you have to put yourself in the shoes of someone who's making decisions about, you know, different options. Um, I think having India as part of that process really injects that, you know, that empathy and, and maybe urgency too that um, some developing countries face, whether they're dealing with, you know, response to COVID or, you know, longer term development challenges. Uh, and the needs are, you know, the needs are just really significant. Um, and, and Craig, you know, I was hoping you might be able to comment on this, you know, as, as the trilateral um, 
partnership is looking at really you know vast needs in the world in the Indo-Pacific, um, even beyond that. You know, is there a case here for maybe setting some strategic priorities, um, whether it be regional or functional? You know, are there areas in which um, you know this trilateral partnership should be focused going forward? Thanks very much, Jonathan. Um, look, I think you know we're, we're looking for opportunity, uh, and uh, from a geographic focus, um, Australia's uh, foreign policy priorities are in the Indo-Pacific region, and and that, and that means that that intersects very neatly with uh, with the, the the focus of the trilateral infrastructure partnership. Um, we we uh, uh, we're not fixed in terms of of, of strategic sectors. Uh, we think there are some sectors that I think are more important in terms of enabling development than others, perhaps. Uh, but uh, we've been very active over the last couple of years in reaching out to to the customer. Uh, and so uh, we've had uh, we've had uh, outreach missions to Papua New Guinea, to Indonesia, and even during COVID last year, uh, ran a virtual mission to Vietnam, which had uh, had had access to to some of the the, the most senior uh, decision makers in the country, including uh, Politburo members. So um, it's it is really understanding what the countries of the Indo Pacific really need and what their priorities are. So I think it's much more important to understand what the customer's priorities are. And I, and I, and I, when, I when I say a customer, I, mean, I do mean the countries of the Indo-Pacific and, and particularly the developing countries of the Indo-Pacific. So we've spent a lot of time listening to them, to understanding what their priorities are uh, and in understanding what infrastructure opportunities might actually work best uh, for a trilateral partnership. I mean, Japan has an enormous uh, infrastructure development program in its own right in Southeast Asia. There are things that Japan can do. There are things that DFC can do. There are things that Australia can do, particularly in the Pacific Islands, <clears throat> which we can do by ourselves. But we're looking for opportunities that make sense to, to really to leverage the expertise uh, and the different types of the blended finance options that we can bring to a project which we might find diffi difficult by ourselves uh, or simply uh, it will be a better outcome if we draw in the expertise uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the three partners. Uh, and, and when we look at the potential for quad, uh, for quad work on this or even more broadly, more you know, uh, uh, other forms of, of collaboration, uh, it just brings in uh, more options and greater expertise. Uh, the Quad may not end up with the same focus ultimately as the Trilateral Infrastructure Partnership, but there is plenty of work for us to do building on uh, our own uh, country programs throughout the region. So, uh, look, I think this is this this is this is a really exciting time to be working together. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity out there, uh, but as I think a number of the the commentators have said. Uh, today, uh, these are complex, uh, uh, complex projects. I'm not an investment banker; I'm a diplomat. But these are things that investment bankers, I'm sure, they eat this stuff for breakfast. Um, uh, 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 and for us, it's about understanding how we can work together, either, either as a trilateral grouping, or as a quad grouping, or as a broader grouping, to be able to deliver the best quality infrastructure at the right price uh, uh, for for our for our customers. Thanks. Thanks. I think, you know, Fumio mentioned that one of the examples of cooperation is this electrification project in Papua New Guinea. Um, another example is um, a subsea cable extension to Palau. And I think it's, it's interesting because, um, you know, not only is it, does it involve um, all three countries and, and sort of creative ways of bringing finance together, um, but this is clearly an area, I think, where there's a, a great need um, globally, but especially in the, in the Indo-Pacific, you know, digital infrastructure. I think, you know, the, the pandemic has really underscored the fact that you do not want to be on the losing side of the digital divide. And just the fact that we're able to have this conversation right now in all these different time zones is dependent on things like subsea cables. Um, and so it's encouraging to see that cooperation. Um, and, and, you know, Craig, Fumio, David, if, if you have reflections on that project, I'd welcome them. You know, what, what have we learned from, um, from, from coming together? You know, I know that that project is still, still in the works. 
Um, uh, but are there lessons that we should be drawing from that experience? Jonathan, I think that's a really good example of, on a number of fronts. Um, I mean, for Australia, we, we've been active in our, our near abroad at, at financing uh, undersea cables to Papua New Guinea and to the Solomon Islands to give them better access to internet and, and in ways in which they don't have strings attached. Uh, but the Palau Spur example is a really interesting one where uh, we, we wouldn't have been able to do that one uh, uh, by ourselves. And it was a really interesting exercise Particularly, and again, this is this learning process that we're going through of uh, deploying both grant finance and, and lending. But in the particular case of Palau as a compact state, actually we found that the US Department of the Interior was an important source of grant financing as well as USAID. Uh, and so, you know, that's a very specific example where there was a really tailored package and it wouldn't have worked if we'd tried to do it by ourselves uh, but coming together, the, the three of us, all contributing slightly different elements, and, and the fact that it's a it's a compact state, and the United States has a has a particular relationship, it was 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 very interesting. It was it was something that worked well in the end, and and, and was a real learning journey for us. Let me add that um, we couldn't have done it by ourselves, and I want to thank Australia for their leadership on this. Um, you know. For a project to come together for one DFI, it's hard enough. DFIs move not so quickly often. There are lots of internal and external approvals um, and it's challenging. If you bring in two or three institutions, it's even more challenging. But this is an example where actually having multiple partners work together very well. So, you know, Australia knows this part of the world extremely well. Uh, they identified this opportunity. They reached out to us, and you know we would not have done this but for their leadership. So we're we're very very excited to partner on this project. It will bring you know connectivity to this uh, underserved part of the world. It will lower the cost for access to technology, and uh, as we just heard from Craig, you know having access to technology during the pandemic is is. A game changer. If you don't have access, your kids don't have the same quality of education or access online. Uh, it's harder to get healthcare. We're doing so much more through technology um, that this spur will actually have a, a very, very significant impact on this region. So we're grateful for our partners. And I think it's a great example of what we can do together if we work together well. So we've, we've focused, um, actually, let me turn to Fumio. Fumio, if you'd like to add anything um, about right. the experience of working on that project. Um, I echo with the, uh, uh, my partners. Um, the key word here is that flexibility in cooperation. And uh, another key word is responding to the needs and intention of the recipient country. So uh, this project cannot be done by, uh, by either of one party of our three countries and that bringing in the strength of each country and uh, to uh, be flexible in responding to the demand uh, concretized in this project. So uh, this um, flexibility and responding to the need is I think is a very key, a key to promote further the trilateral cooperation. Thank you. Thanks. And so, you know, we've, we've talked a bit about sort of knowing your customer here. Um, and I think there are, you know, at least two other important audiences worth mentioning. Um, and I'd like to turn to Isabel to, to hear a little bit about how, um, you know, what she's hearing from these audiences and her, her work on the Blue Dot Network. You know, one of them is the, the private sector, right? I think that's, that's really where a lot of the financial firepower resides that um, could be unlocked to, to really um, scale some of these efforts. Um, how are how are how is the private sector, um, you know, reacting to the idea of the Blue Dot Network? Um, are the is, is this something that you know? Are there institutional investors, places like pension funds and others, who are prepared to actually put real money, um, you know, make some real commitments um, to 
yeah, you know, at, when the framework when the framework is operational. Um, tell us a little bit about what you're hearing. Yeah, thanks, John. And I, and I think this also links to, to, to what the project ECHO, which is also, I believe, financed by, by the private sector. And, and they are indeed a, a key player, both for investment, but also ensuring that the infrastructure is, is developed um, sustainably and that they can compete with other actors in the region. So, look, based on our experience, um, the response from the, from the private sector has been really enthusiastic. Um, I mentioned earlier the executive consultation group that we've developed, um, and they've been extremely engaged in this in this project. You know, actively contributing at a technical level, providing high level guidance. You know, within from the C suite, from from the senior management, and they've really emphasised um, the the positive benefits that will flow from the Blue Dot certification framework. And, and a number of them were outlined, John, in our event two days ago with, with the Secretary of State. Um, but primarily, they really look to the fact that the Blue Dot Network will reduce risks associated with large infrastructure investments, um, particularly in countries with weaker governance and regulatory frameworks, um, because it ensures that projects themselves are aligned with international standards and, and to a degree will be monitored over the life cycle of a, a, an infrastructure project uh, to continue to meet those standards. Um, uh, the focus often is, is on the fact that it will help establish a more level playing field um, by shifting the focus from the lowest cost of construction uh, to value for money considerations, where the full costs, um, if they're social, environmental and um, uh, financial, uh, will be um, um, understood over the, the, the entire project life cycle. Um, so this is also really important. Um, the next part is, is really to establish a shared understanding around, among stakeholders in infrastructure, if that's governments, project developers or investors, of what constitutes quality infrastructure and agreeing, um, as, as, as Craig has, has outlined, um, you know, with the standard and, and with what the, the, the customer or, or, or the, the end users of infrastructure require. Uh, so the Blue Dot Network has the potential to really build that into the framework. Um, and finally, I think what it does is it starts to reduce the scope of the risks around uh, investing or development, for example, um, around corruption, um, because it starts to, um, I, I guess, set a clear requirement uh, in terms of what is transparency and what is accountability. Uh, and if we think about that, the Blue Dot Network doesn't just uh, develop um, a clear requirement or set a clear requirement for uh, anti-corruption, but it also does this in, in, in regards to climate, environment, uh, human rights, labour issues, uh, in a way that allows the private sector to feel safer to invest. So, look, this isn't just my, 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 my sense from, from conversations. We have surveyed the private sector um, on this very issue, um, in, and we asked them if a certification scheme would incentivise them to increase their investment in infrastructure projects, and overwhelmingly, the response was yes. So 97% of respondents said that they would um, be more motivated to invest in infrastructure if there was a global certification framework attached to, that, to, attached to that. So John, in relation to your, 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 your specific focus on institutional investors, um, of that group, we had uh, in institutional investors and asset managers representing over 12 trillion in assets under management that were a part of that 97% group that, that, that said it was uh, worth engaging with. So really from the, the, the support and the analysis that we've, we've done on behalf of the trilateral, we have seen a, a clear indication that institutional investors have greater confidence in investing in projects that are Blue Dot Network certified. Um, but of course, um, this will be tested once the, um, the, the global certification is developed and founding members launch the scheme and, and have a pipeline of certified projects. Yeah, well, and when you're talking about uh, $12 trillion, you know, it doesn't take a, a large percentage of, you know, of that to, to make a, a significant difference. Um, so it's a, it, it, pretty encouraging to hear. Um, we're starting to get some good questions from the audience. So I, I, I'd like to start working some of those in. And I'd like to invite people again to submit questions um, using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, Craig, I'm gonna go to you with this one, but others are welcome to, uh, to jump in. Um, this is a question about 
um, from a, the, the question is from a diplomatic perspective, are countries more receptive to assistance on a bilateral or a multilateral basis um, than they are, you know, just a, a, a sorry, are, are, are they more receptive bilaterally or multilaterally? And then when done multilaterally, um, is one country identified as the lead nation? Um, so in, any reactions to that? Again, sort of knowing your customer here, how are, how are countries reacting? I think it, I mean, it, 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 in some ways it doesn't really matter uh, how many countries are involved. It does come down to trust. Uh, it comes down to trust about whether uh, the partners that are engaging on a program, whether that's uh, a, you know, a bilateral one or, or through the trilateral infrastructure partnership, it does come down to trust, and that's 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 I think the key, the key the, the key element of the relationship. And I mean, there, there are many other aspects for complex infrastructure deals. Price is always important too. Uh, I think the thing that that certainly Australia, uh, as really the, the to, you know to be candid, the smallest member of the of the trilateral infrastructure partnership, um, we don't always bring um, a large amount of money. Uh, to projects in the Indo-Pacific, but we do bring a brand of trust and quality, uh, and that's something that shines through, and that's something that, that allows us to work very successfully bilaterally with countries of the Indo-Pacific, and it's something that we bring to the trilateral infrastructure partnership as well. So but my sense is that uh, is that as customers are interested in good quality product and are interested in partners that they can trust uh, 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 as long as as long as the finances stack up, whether that's bilateral, whether that's trilateral, whether that's through a multilateral pat platform, uh, I, I haven't noticed uh, that to be uh, quite quite as fundamental as as the other factors. Thanks, and so you know, welcome other other comments on that. Um, let me ask another question um, in the meantime um, of David. Um, you know, this is, I'm kind of combine a couple here, but I think this is a common question that people have sometimes. How, how big is this all going to be in financial terms? And how does it compare to China's Belt and Road Initiative? Um, you know, is this, how do these things stack up? Um, I, you know, I think personally, having, having, having uh, done a lot of Belt and Road tracking, I think we should probably ask, what year of Belt and Road are we talking about? There's been a pretty significant decline. Um, but David, if you could comment sort of on the potential for scale here and, and how this compares with and, and competes with China's Belt and Road. So, you know, I don't think that we're seeking to try to pursue a dollar for dollar approach or to follow anybody around. Um, we're providing a different model, a model that is sustainable, a model that focuses on the private sector a model that does not leave countries in a debt trap and a model that's transparent. We're also pursuing a model which relies on the private sector. So I was just in Ecuador, for example, last week, Colombia, Panama, to talk about the Build Back Better uh, World Initiative. And we heard all throughout the region of projects which had been financed through different alternatives, which are not successful a dam which is now poorly constructed and creating risks for the community in which it's been built. Uh, countries which are finding themselves in a debt trap. And so what we're trying to do is really amplify the fact that our model is different. It's private sector driven, it's transparent, and that we are gonna increase our capacity between us and the G7, and I said, I think also, you know, with with our partners on the phone. So, just an example, the DFC, you know, with, thanks to Congress in the Build Act, we have the authority to double our capacity. And this year, we're stretching. We just finished our fiscal year, and we'll be well up over fifty percent from the previous five-year average. Uh, we've been asked. I mentioned we've been asked to stretch in health, and. You know, we have invested somewhere between five and six times our average spend in the last five years on health, including several vaccine manufacturing projects, which together will have the capacity to produce two billion doses of vaccines, two billion doses. Um, one of those is in Africa, 
and they're going to produce hundreds of millions of doses in Africa for Africa. And if you think about the numbers in Africa, where they're still in many countries less than five percent uh, vaccinated, you know, if they can produce 450 or 500 million doses, there are 1.3 billion uh, people in in sub in Africa, and you know, some six seven hundred million are eligible for the for the vaccine. So four to 500 do million doses is gonna go a long way to vaccinate that continent. And that's, that's happening through our help and with the help of our partners. So we are gonna increase our flow. The G7 is gonna increase our, their flow. And together we're providing an alternative to one model of financing. Fumia, go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, with regards to the scale question, um, I would like to uh, refer to the number that is published at the uh, fact sheet of the Quad uh, Summit held last month. Well, Quad is the three country plus India. Um, they say since 2015, Quad partners have pro provided more than 48 billion US dollars in official finance for infrastructure in the region. So this represent the uh, how the scale of impact of the last five years that these three countries plus India has been doing in this region. And also I would like to uh, refer to the uh, efforts of Asian Development Bank, which they created a special fund in 2016 uh, calling its name LEAP, which is the acronym of Leading Asia's Private Infrastructure. Its aim is to boost high quality and sustainable private infrastructure investment across emerging economies in Asia and Pacific, and that it can provide finance up to 16 billion US dollars. Um, this fund is capitalized with 1.5 US uh, billion dollars of commitment by JICA. So just for your reference, back to you. Thanks, thanks for, for um, the, those facts. And, you know, I think one of the other important, um, differentiating factors here are the terms, right. That are being offered for financing. And so that number that you referenced from quad countries, that's a, that's a, a, a much, you know, much lower interest rates involved with that set of financing than are provided with the sort of, um, that, that are often provided with other, uh, from other lenders, other major lenders. Um, uh, one of the one of the themes that has has come up a few times in people's comments, we haven't really touched on it directly yet, um, but several times in passing, is the importance of transparency. Um, and so there's a question here about how do we ensure um, that uh, these customer countries or recipient countries are um, you know are having an environment that is open and transparent. Um, and Isabel, let me let me turn to you, maybe because there was a, a big announcement earlier this week at the OECD about a new anti-corruption toolkit, um, and I think that could potentially play a role here. Yeah, absolutely, and you, you're spot on, John. That that this is really uh, one of the key the keys to to the success of of infrastructure development is tackling corruption. And as we know, you know, corruption is 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 one of the most insidious forms of, of, of destabilization of, of democracy. It, it distorts investment and the underlying cause of some of the world's greatest challenges. So the US um, um, Department of State was launched under uh, the, the, the Secretary of State this week in, in partnership with the OECD uh, has launched a, a, a infrastructure, um, an infrastructure anti-corruption toolkit or toolbox to assist all countries um, and to assist all actors to address corruption in infrastructure. Um, so the aim of the project is really forward looking. It's a toolbox of practical ways to prevent, detect, respond to corruption, including through identifying best practices and conducting trainings and capacity buildings with organisations around the world. And if we think about this in the context of the, of the Blue Dot Network, it's, it's really quite critical because while we want the Blue Dot Network to be accessible to as many um, projects as possible, we also want to stimulate this race to the top or this alternative model that David was, was, was inferring to is that the Blue Dot Network itself really is about a set of values and, 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 and an approach to infrastructure uh, investment driven by um, the market that 
um, should really incentivize actors to understand the long-term value of quality infrastructure investment. So where corruption often is the most corrosive force to that, uh, we want to provide actors with the means to, to, to be able to develop infrastructure in an open, transparent um, and, and an integrity-based based platform. So really, um, it's, it's an important announcement by the, the, the State Department. The OECD, as, as many of you know, uh, is the host of, of some of the leading uh, instruments in anti-corruption, if it be the Convention on Combating Bribery for, for Foreign Officials or the Recommendation on Public Procurement. So ensuring that no actors get left behind and that people can, you know, the projects and uh, actors can meet a blue dot, we want to be able to have, be able to take them on that journey and, and to provide a toolkit of capacity building and other tools uh, where we can really start to meet that standard uh, and ensure a, a, a race to the top for, for all countries and, and all actors in the Indo-Pacific, but also Latin America and, and Asia. Um, so it's an exciting announcement. Um, I think it does really support the, the, the values under the blue dot um, and, and we look forward to kicking it off with, with the State Department uh, this week. Terrific. We're down to the wire here. I want to give um, the group a chance to, to answer one last question um, so that someone makes the observation here that you know, there are several new initiatives now related to um, global infrastructure. We've obviously talked about the Blue Dot Network. We've talked about Build Back Better World. Um, and there's also the EU's recently announced Global Gateway. Um, so the question is, you know, is, is there an opportunity here to consolidate or better coordinate these initiatives so that they align? Or is there a risk now that we're heading into a scenario in which we have too many the separate competing initiatives. Um, so let me let me turn to Craig first for his thoughts on that. Um, and then each of you, if you could just briefly, if, if you'd like to briefly comment, and then we'll wrap up there. Uh, look, I think there's, you know, you just can't have too many players, quality players in, 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 the, in the market here. And uh, and we very much welcome the EU's role in the Indo-Pacific. Um, I've spent a lot of time talking uh, with Brussels and with other and with other capitals about uh, about the EU's uh, infrastructure role, it, it's already got a profound uh, set of relationships in the Indo-Pacific, and uh, the work that they, that they'll do through their new, new initiative, I think, complements work that others are doing. I suspect we, uh, uh, there'll be great opportunities for us to learn from each other uh, and to share our own experience. But I, don't, I certainly don't think. Uh, the, 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 there's, there's a crowded market here. There's, there's lots of opportunity, and I think we welcome uh, all countries who can adhere to the sorts of standards uh, that the Blue Dot Network represents. Thanks. David, any comments? I would just say that we are stretching, pushing, and trying to move as quickly as we can to meet the significant challenges. And so we're about to put out some information on our performance for the fiscal year, which just ended it's uh, 9.30. And I think uh, we're going to be running hard going forward. Fumio. Right. Thank you. Um, we, I echo with the Craig also that um, there, since the demand in, on infrastructure in this region is so large that there's a room for everybody. But what is important is that to realize the quality growth in developing countries, and it is in, in, indispensable not only to meet the quantitative uh, demand, but also to consider the quality, such as transparency, openness, or economic efficiency in view of life cycle cost and debt sustainability in infrastructure uh, development. So, um, not only the uh, the quantitative demand that needs to be filled in, but more the players who can bring about the qu quality uh, infrastructure. It's uh, our position is very much welcoming uh, to have such partners in this region. Thank you. Isabel, I'll give you the last word here. Obviously, one way to, to, to merge these would be to have, um, you know, European participation, more European participation in Blue Dot Network. Um, but your thoughts on this question of competing 
and complementing uh, initiatives. Yeah, and I'd echo what Craig said, that there are complementing initiatives and from the OECD's perspective and as a multilateral organisation, you know, the Blue Dot Network could be the platform and the standard setter for all of those, those instruments. And I think as much as we can combine with um, the, the, the shared values of, of the OECD members, if it be with the Global Gateway or with, with the Build Back Better World, then, then we should aim to do that. And the, the more we can complement each other, the better. Okay, thanks, thanks so much um, again for, for uh, all of our guests for joining us, um, you know, from uh, Canberra, from Tokyo, from Paris. Um, thank you for doing this uh, from Washington, D.C. Um, and thanks also for some, some really good questions from the audience. I apologize we weren't able to get to all of them. Um, please do um, keep an eye out for future programming from us on this set of issues. We've got some research in the pipeline, um, and I'm assuming that we'll have some more conversations as well. So thank you for joining us and hope you have a good day.